over the place before Owsley's did. No. Oh. You know, it what, came out of what, that game. What was the name of that? Uh, uh, that? Well, you, you can ask him about that okay. story. About the call. acid that Doobie took to San Francisco. That wasn't like clear light or anything like no, that? No, no, this is 1960. Okay, 60. Yeah, this is way before anybody knew about it. Mostly. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. it was that acid. The, the gay guy that, mm -hmm. I mean, it's incredible what Dave ran across and yeah. knows, you yeah. know, and who uh -huh. he bumped into. Right. But the... The point is, he ends up back and he's channeling awareness after Doobie yeah. dies in '67. He does that till '74. Mm -hmm. In '74, he um, there's a power struggle by yeah. a guy named Avaton, who who's trying to work up, who doesn't like Worcester's gang, mm -hmm. and he was part of the old Doobie gang, and he gets Shockley to channel, and they do it at this gathering in outside Seattle mm -hmm. where they met every year, mm -hmm. and they uh, interrupted. A, a session while Dave was in trance, and he had it seized up his uh, chakras, his bones, or something. Mm -hmm. He had a neck problem or something for many years, mm -hmm. but he quit after that, and he went to L.A. So from '75 to '94, he's in L.A. first, and then he's uh, Highland. You know that part called Highland? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's up there near Chinatown or something. Mm -hmm. I think it is. And then he goes out to Lake some Lake Elsinore in the early '80s, and he's there till. Say 86, 87. Then he moves to Marina del Rey, so he's part of the Venice world uh -huh. for about seven years till 94. Uh -huh. Then he moves back up to Bellevue in 94. So that's the stage. So you've got a, you've got almost 20 years in California. And when we when we met um, when we met Jerry in 88, we introduced Worcester to, to Jerry then, or when we went back there in 93. Mm -hmm. So Worcester would always see Jerry on the boardwalk, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 93, 94, maybe even earlier. So that's how we knew Jerry, and he'd been to Jerry's house uh, with me. So that's why he knows Jerry. Mm -hmm. So that's his basic, you know, trajectory. Mm -hmm. So what else uh, you did, uh, what did you say about UFOs? Do you know what his middle name is? Uh, Eugene. Yeah, you got it. Huh? It's Eugene. Eugene. Yeah, that's right. And he's born May t the day before Dylan. Uh, Dylan's 24, or and Dave is 23. That's Dave's right. 23. That's right. 23. Yeah, and and Dylan's May 24. Yeah. So he's on the cusp of uh of your sign and Gemini. Yeah, he's still a Gemini. Now, what's really amazing is that, um. Dave doesn't know about this world. I've mentioned it, but he doesn't know it. The uh, Rai talked about man dying. You know, man, Rai created man, and man died. Mm -hmm. So in the late 60s, early 70s, Roland Barth and all the postmoderns ta start talking about the death of man. Okay? Mm -hmm. Baudrillard developed it in a lot of ways. But if you see a picture of Baudrillard, he looks just like Worcester. Really? It's amazing. So the, the main thesis of... of Cosmic awareness um, coming through Doobie and then and then uh, Dave was from '62 on. What went on in Seattle, which was a city at that time that had the highest number of atheists of any city in in North America. <laughs> really nice. That was his distinction. So there was a lot of interesting energies there in Seattle, mm -hmm. and the the main point was that what that what that group did would uh, be what they call a psychodrama or would be a uh, an archetype, mm -hmm. and it would manifest out all across consciousness mm -hmm. uh, in the media, or whatever, after it happened there or within three weeks. Mm -hmm. So they're doing LSD sessions in the late 50s mm -hmm. before they get into cosmic awareness. And then it shows up later with Leary in mm -hmm. the public. Yeah. And many things they did in, the, in 62 to 65 became the New Age and laid out uh, you know, years later. And that is an interesting history when he talks about that. Uh-huh. That somehow, if you believe it, they were in a fulcrum and, and acting out um, something uh, as before it, it was like the first humans doing it, and then it would go out across consciousness. Right. Now, it came through awareness that when uh, Hoffman was inventing the LSD or working on it in 38, and then it sits there till 42 or 43, mm -hmm. whatever was going on that five year period, not sure which part of it, awareness said there was a guy craw crawling up. Uh, there was a famous mountain climber or somebody who was mountain climbing Everest or uh, um, something, some mm -hmm. heavy mountains. His climbing up the mountains was the physical manifestation of what was happening for the LSD to come through. Mm -hmm. So I get from it that what people do 
individual people all over the planet. They walk around, and whatever they do is triggering off connections on other levels mm -hmm. that manifest in other phenomena. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So the phenomena that they were doing in Seattle manifested all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, it's the it's the hundred monkey phenomena. Right, right. It's the hundred hundred monkey. And the interesting about Dave is that he's such an interesting guy. You know, yeah. you, once you meet him, you could believe it. Well, yeah, no, I mean he's definitely out there. I mean, yeah. <coughs> I didn't want to get. I wanted. I have more, much more to talk about than we even got started. Right. But we, would this this preliminary conversation <coughs> would give you the parameters of how to start your questioning, maybe? Well. Yeah, he, you know, or don't redo it. Redo the same. I point. just, I'm just going to free associate with him because right. I feel like he's one of the few people that I can have a real conversation with and not have to, go, you know, you don't have to explain yourself, you know. That's right. Yeah, and that's because he's had the same experiences that I've had. Um, yeah, and more. And probably that's probably why more. you like me because yeah. I learned a lot from him. No, you I'm like not. talking to me. Well, I'd like you anyway, Bob. Whether you talk to right. if you but I if you were a mute, I would like you, Bob. <laughs> yes, but I understood uh, the <laughs> metaphysical principle yeah. that, mm -hmm. of post Christian Murdy. Yeah, and I, and I got a lot from him, and then I yeah. probably could understand what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you you were right there. You've always never had any trouble because he right. asked a lot of fucking questions, but. <laughs> Trivial question. I've kept thinking. Of, I've been talking to Worcester, and I'm thinking, God, I don't ask questions like Bob does. You know? <laughs> now, what do you mean by that? Now, when specifically was that? What date was that? Now, when the birthday? What longitude and latitude were you at? Yeah. <laughs> well, the reason I do that is because I connect it to my own history or the history of the world that I can remember. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You yeah. tell me what happened in March 65, I can then think of some things that happened either to me or other people. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's how I trigger. Then I'll say it to that person, and they mm -hmm. go, oh, yeah. And then they'll, they'll say mm -hmm. something. That's how you trigger their memory. I got it. Oh, I see what you're doing. You're associating. It's a mnemonic. You're making it's associations, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I got his address. I'm going to send him a check of a few bucks. I don't have much money myself. Oh, great. He, he didn't ask for that, did no, he? No, he didn't ask for that. He wouldn't ask for that. He's a man of great principle and uh, right. high Right. He tells us great story. He's an right. elegant man. He's a really... A, and I said, haven't you... Have you, have you ever thought about writing a book about your life? He says, well, you know, he says, it's better if other people do it, you know. <laughs> so, and he says, you know, they like the way I speak, but I just don't, you know, I guess he doesn't write, you know, he doesn't want to. Yeah, because I think he's into the flow. I think he's so highly intuitive that he's still channeling to this day. I mean, that's why I passed on. Here, here's what. That's why I passed on the thing about the SL because he, I think he picked up from me. Yes, yeah. Some Let me tell you a couple thing. of stories yeah. to show you how sensitive it is. Right. When I, I met him in '69, and then I would drop in every couple of years. And I remember in '71, mm -hmm. I gave him head comics. Oh yeah. Our crumbs head oh, comics. Oh god <laughs> damn. Yeah. You know, Mr. Natural stuff. Uh huh. And he sat down, and he was like a, a monk, you know, like uh -huh. Aquinas. He was reading it, uh -huh. and he told me later that just to read, he sees so many levels. Yes. That it, he, it's very slow. Mm -hmm. And awareness talked about it's time to close the book and uh, yeah. move into action, yeah. and that resonates with McLuhan. Yeah. See, I see McLuhan saying that right. Mm -hmm. When the TV becomes the, the viewer becomes the screen, mm -hmm. that is the technological reflection of the fact that Ryi returned to essence, and there was no separateness anymore between spirit and matter. Mm -hmm. So, um, so one there's one example of a sensitivity, mm -hmm. and uh, it's too slow for the multiple levels he lives. Another yeah. example is in the late '60s, he mm -hmm. went up to Seattle, to Alaska, mm -hmm. and he went on TV and he broadcast. You know, mm -hmm. he did the uh, mm -hmm. oracular or. Yeah. He did something. They yeah. featured him on TV. He said he was laid up for three days yeah. after because yeah. of the psychic effect of being on TV. Yeah, he's going. He's going. He's doing a radio interview tomorrow. Oh, for who? Oh, uh, some PBS channel up there, local. I wonder how that happened. I don't know, but I'm going to figure that. I don't know, but I'm gonna, maybe it's time to, for the world to hear from him. I'm calling him before that. He's got me scheduled in before. Great. So, but so, okay, so he goes. He on, told me to read the 139th Psalm. Have you ever read the 139th Psalm? He's mentioned many times, but I don't remember it. I don't even know. I said, "Is that Jesus?" He says, "No, it's uh, David." <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, I don't know. What it is. I'll have to look at that. Yeah, is that an old time Psalm? I thought anything that was a Psalm was what Jesus said. 
No, the Psalms are written by Solomon or David or King David. It's David, that. then. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I thought, what do they call the things? Is this? What do they call that stuff that's in the different colors in the Bible? That they're Jesus's words. They're called Psalms, aren't they? No, I don't think mm-hmm. so. Uh, mm-hmm. The Psalms, the, there's kings, the songs of Solomon, and there's the Psalms of David. I think. All oh, right. Really? No. That's Old Testament. But the yeah. so okay. So he's so sensitive. He, he yeah. said the, the psychic consequences of going on the electric media yeah. and putting it out there, mm-hmm. he immediately felt the effects of yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Now, that's pretty sensitive. Another time, he's told mm-hmm. me that he spends, he doesn't spend much time in the uh, the cortex, mm-hmm. that he spends a lot of his time, you know, in the invisible zone, in the uh, unconscious zone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's like a state of meditation, but sub, below the cortex. The sub- i got to ask him about all of that shit. Yeah. I, I, we haven't even gotten, you know, all we got you is... Write the, you write that down? Do you, write, you should make notes. TV in Alaska. All right. Bob, uh, how, it's, how, how, how hard it is for him to read. Um, and um, because, and that's so, so post Gutenberg. You need to today to be tuned in. It's happening so fast. If you want to keep tuned in, which is what he does, he monitors the news regularly. He, he's tuned into what's happening. He's paying attention mm-hmm. all the time. He's living in the, the electric present. Why write something? Especially since that's concept, and he's post Krishnamurti, mm-hmm. which, which who blows the water out of concept. Right. Krishnamurti didn't know that McLuhan saw that post concept was a, an environment. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. A perceptual environment. Mm-hmm. So Worcester is sensitive and about that, mm-hmm. and um, he uh, okay. There's the reading, the TV, Pink Floyd, Pink Floyd, and he's he doesn't live in his cortex too much. Mm-hmm. Cortex. And, and he um, has had has had luck in all kinds of strange ways. <clears throat> and he was now. Here's where you begin. In 1949, he would have been 21 years old. Mm-hmm. Maybe he was becoming 22. He was in the Navy, and he's in, he was in Hawaii. Now, this is really important. Mm-hmm. This is where it begins. He's in Hawaii in 1949, stationed there. And he gets on the, the Navy radio, the local radio, whatever the radio was there, mm-hmm. and he plays music. And mm-hmm. he attracts the attention of the Kahuna magicians in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. They like his voice. Mm-hmm. And I think he was called Blue David, or the Blue Boy. Blue Boy, because he, he wore blue or something mm-hmm. a lot. So he then got initiated into the Kahuna Hawaiian guy. Oh, no shit. That's fucking early. Mm-hmm. Because they picked up his energies from the, being a radio DJ. That's where mm-hmm. you begin. Mm-hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, well, I, I haven't got... He doesn't know I'm a hypnotherapist or anything like that. Well, that's well. He studied hypnosis. He well, I know he did, and that's why. I mean, I'm I, I haven't wanted. Rai to... was the original hypnosis. I mean, he. Well, how do you say Rai? What is that? I don't know about Rai. Rai was the. How do you so spell make a it? Note about that. What's Rai? How, how do you spell it? R R H Y E E. R H. Think of Ra coming from that. Rai. Okay. The Egyptian Ra. Rai was the original. When he describes the beginning of existence or spirit Mm -hmm. Um, spirit was existing and there would be a vibe so everything would be um, red Mm -hmm. then it would shift to blue Mm -hmm. and all spirit would come blue Okay, this is this is you know human conceptualization of the spirit yeah yeah anthropomorphic yes Mm -hmm. I'm projecting here so it's all blue Mm -hmm. then it started to move into green Mm -hmm. but one little blue and my order of colors may be different from what yeah, Dave says. Yeah. But one little blue refused to become green. Mm-hmm. So some aspect of green smashed the blue that did not become green. Mm-hmm. That was Rai. Mm-hmm. It judged the resistance of blue mm-hmm. and did not accept it and hit it and then took off. And consciousness chased it or watched it take off, spiral off, and it created all these levels of matter like you have in the theosophical theology. And eventually created this dimension. Mm-hmm. So Rai took off in this act of judgment after smashing the blue stone or the green stone, whichever was the second color, and takes off and creates this dimension. It's now created matter, and now it's isolated. Mm-hmm. So spirit created a female, or an Isis factor, mm-hmm. which would come and live in the Rai-made world, mm-hmm. And try to bring Rai back to spirit or the plane of essence. Mm-hmm. And that's the dialectic between uh, men and women. Now, the deal Rai, Rai accepted Isis in mm-hmm. his, man, his dimension, 
if she agreed, and maybe she offered this to seduce him, mm -hmm. she said, I will perpetuate this dimension mm -hmm. by bearing kids and keep it going. Mm -hmm. So the, the creation of uh, generations was caught, was a setup between Rai and Isis. Is is. Yes. Yeah. Now, what happened after Rai returned to Essence? You know, millions, thousands. Well, who is Rai and what mythology is he in? It comes through cosmic awareness. Oh, this okay. Comes through All cosmic right. awareness. All right, great. All right. This is a name that you can see the resonances of it in Ra and that. Right. But it's the original separateness that right. created this dimension on right. this, on the deeper level. Gotcha. So Isis has this relationship with Rai, which is the male female archetype. Rai mm -hmm. returned to Essence. It turned out that Duby was miming the. The mm -hmm. last days of Rai mm -hmm. in 66, 67. So he dies in January 67, and Rai returns to essence. There's no more separateness. Mm -hmm. And so our wombs were closed at that point. Mm -hmm. The beginning of the closing of the deal of procreation between Rai and Isis ended at that point. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of the womb with a view. Big pardon? Yeah, the womb with a view. That's right. the end of the womb uh, with a view. Yes. All right. And so Rai is the where all principalities, all hypnosis, the word author, Dave used to say in lectures, uh -huh. um, has the word awe in it, A-W-E. Uh -huh. And Rai is setting up an awe, a mm -hmm. hypnosis, which is really a separateness mm -hmm. and a way of controlling matter. Mm -hmm. And that's what Rai is. All of control functions, priests, principalities, kingdoms, I say in my chart, media, if you notice Rai is on my chart, mm -hmm. media is the after image of Rai, because when Rai returns to essence, awareness said, cosmic awareness said, there was only the cobwebs of Rai left. Mm -hmm. And I see that as the uh, media, mm -hmm. the Internet. So yeah, he, he reminded me that he was one of your, one of the, what do you call them? Your, uh, the holy offices. Holy offices and uh, stuff. And, and I didn't say anything to him, but I will. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the, there's on the on the memo to Prince Charles, the booklet in the album. Yeah. I have the ten holy offices: yeah. McLuhan, yeah. Herbert W. Armstrong, Larouche, Zappa, mm -hmm. Joyce, Beter, May Brussel. Uh, there's seven. I use the seven liberal arts. Mm -hmm. Each one's rhetoric, grammar, mm -hmm. or um, logic, music, astronomy, mm -hmm. uh, arithmetic, and uh, mm -hmm. geometry, mm -hmm. and music. And then number eight is mediumship. I bring in the non-Western occult, and that's mm -hmm. cosmic awareness. Mm -hmm. And also the evergreens, but nobody knew about the evergreens, so yeah. I call it cosmic awareness. Mm -hmm. And then the personal personal education is always someone you get initiated personally by. That's Garrett Dean. Mm -hmm. So he is holy office number eight. Mm -hmm. The late Garrett Dean. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Who I've talked to through the evergreens. Oh, good. How's he doing? Well, that was many years ago. He was doing great, but I found out uh, uh, some interesting stuff that he did around me that I was curious about. Oh. And he explained it. Great. Like at one time, he he, he sort of, uh, what happens, I was sitting with him one day in his home. This is in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. He left the room, this great kitchen. Now, he had a powerful voice. He was much like Worcester mm -hmm. uh, in terms of communication, mm -hmm. living in the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I met Worcester. And I took their development classes in 69, 70, and then I met Garrett in 71 where I met the living version of mm -hmm. Worcester. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Or a living expression of what I kind of learned from Worcester. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though Worcester himself was that, but I, that, he was on the other side of the continent. So I became a longtime friend of Garrett, and like after like 75, 76, one time uh, he leaves the room, goes down the hall, and he comes back. And all of a sudden I see him standing in the doorway of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. and he's got this son of intense look in his face and he's got a big knife in his hand and it looks like he's going to stab something hmm. and it could be me but he's holding back he's <laughs> vibrating like he, he's stuck in some weird state of mind where he can't go forward yeah. so I watched him quivering there with this big knife and uh, eventually uh, he stopped mm -hmm. and he went in the kitchen and put the knife down and I never said a word yeah. I didn't say anything but what the fuck was that uh. So when he died, I asked him, I said, what happened then? Mm -hmm. turned out that he said that um, he had this weird brain condition, and the, and the Evergreens went into the chemistry of it, yeah. where he would have these uh, weird seizures. Yeah. And um, I'm missing one element of it. I can't remember. I don't know what the knife part it was. But he would have these all the time. This is Doobie? Or, or? So this is Garrett Dean. Garrett Dean. Oh, okay. Garrett Dean in Nova Scotia. I'm with him after I've met Worcester. Right. I'm back okay. in Nova oh, Scotia. Okay. okay. All right. And he was a Broadway actor. Yeah. 
right. but he was born in Nova Scotia. But he was right. an incredible orator. You heard him on Furry Lint, I think. Yeah, I did. I've heard. Uh, yeah. So he he's there frozen with this knife, and so what's going on? So I ask him through the Evergreens after he dies in '93, and he says his brain seizure. It was it was like a, a weird epileptic fit, oh. and he um, he would have it. You know, he couldn't control when he was having it, but that's why he became reclusive. Mm-hmm. Because he didn't know when he'd have this weird mm-hmm. thing, yeah. And I can't remember why the knife aspect of it. It mm-hmm. was like he, he was his mind wanted to do something, but the other part of the mind would cancel it out. Mm-hmm. And I don't I can't remember what he said about actually stabbing me or what the hell that was about. But uh, that's what I found out the mystery of what happened. That day. And then Garrett said, "I was very glad that you didn't tell anybody about that, and that mm-hmm. you didn't uh, say anything, and you handled it very well." So I got the compliment. <laughs> yeah. So that's the kind of that's one thing we talked about. Mm-hmm. And then we talked about uh, another time I talked to me he gave me some clues about New York City mm-hmm. uh, that uh, was interesting because you know he'd grown up he'd lived so many years he was in New York City from like the middle twenties to the late sixties then then he stopped going there so much in the in the 70s. this this is Worcester okay, this is Garrett Dean oh Garrett Dean Garrett did. Dean okay. the ninth holy office okay. the one who's my personal oh, initiation okay. all right all right but I met I met Worcester and learned all about. That stuff out yeah. in Cosmic Awareness Land, right. and then I go back and meet someone who I'm prepared to handle. So did you? Um, you get that? I'm prepared to handle uh, prepared. Team yeah. by, by being educated a bit by worse right. in that world. Right, right. But then I meet this guy who I'm going to spend a lot of time with, who uh, who who does the whole thing on me. I mean, I learned a lot from Garrettine just by living in his house. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Team. Didn't you have a, a video of? Uh, your last? Uh, yes, the, my lecture probably showed my lecture, and at the end of it, he's talking. Uh, you have a you have a video where you go to his house and, and stuff. Oh, that's the audio at the beginning of Who's Forgotten Furry Lint. Yes, we walk up to his house, we go in, and we talk for about about twenty minutes on tape. I've got hours of him on tape. Oh, I thought you had it on videotape. Well, I do have a shot. I don't have that on video. That's on audio, but I. Uh, um, a, uh, a few weeks later, that was done in December '83. Yeah. A few weeks later, yeah. I spoke at a university in Halifax, right. and he came to it. And after the lecture, we have him interacting with various people. That's on tape, mm. and Jerry probably has it and probably showed it to you. No, I think I think you showed it to me somewhere. And it was going up the stairs and you know going up to ringing the doorbell. No, that, that's the audio. That's the beginning of Who's Forgotten Furry Lynn. Are you telling me I'm having a synesthetic re- yes. experience? Your memory is mutating. I showed you I'm, the video of him in a, in a classroom with right. me, yeah. and then you're overlaying with the audio you yeah. heard. All right, so the audio, I swear to God, I can see the visuals on the audio. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what's so great about that tape. That yeah. Who's forgotten Freeland? It's a dramatic. I mean, you've, yeah. I think you've heard it. Worcester's yeah. on it. Everybody's on it. Yeah. All the holy opposites. Yeah, but I didn't, know, I didn't know those people. You know. Right. Well, May Brussels mm-hmm. on it, mm-hmm. Dr. Beter. I know her. Peter's one of the holy opposites. Yeah. So Jerry probably played you some of that. That I'll never And he may understand. have shown you the video. Or I showed you the video when you were at my place in 91. Yeah, maybe you did. Yeah. Have you mentioned just a side thing? Did you mention Sophia that I might want to call her? You, didn't, you haven't talked yeah, to her? Yeah, I told her. Yeah. Told okay, her. good. She's interested in... Did you well, I said, I, you know, she, I, I talked to her briefly uh, today. Did you mention Jim George, the name? I mentioned Jim George. She never heard of him. Okay, well, I'll tell her. I'll tell and her she him. And she says that uh, the threshold was founded in uh, 70 or 71. Um, that may be, I have to check. I know that George Jim George took it over in the early '80s. Now it, okay. they oh. may probably brought him in to manage it. Or oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll have okay. to see. All right. She may not have that right. I'll read it right out of the book to her. Yeah, that's the, and tell her the name of the book and all that stuff. And I'm sure she'd be. In, she was interested in. Right. Hearing Go back to Dave. So yeah. the the year um, you were talking now, he has great. Did you ever see Christian Murdy talk? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have seen them. Because yeah. Dave and them are very involved with the Christian Murdy world early, mm-hmm. and they have lots of amazing stories on Christian yeah, Murdy and people yeah. that were involved. And, uh, Christian Murdy was great. He's a Taurus, too. Right. And, and mm-hmm. Dave, Dave Manette, Dave uh, Millette. Millette. Dave Milletta. Hey, Carol, what's that guy's name? Dave Millette? Millette? Dave Millette? Is that his name? Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what is Judy Turok's husband's name? Wagner. Saul? Stephen? Sherman? Sheldon. Sheldon. Okay. Um, the, uh, Sheldon. 
Yeah, that was just some other side thing. I remember oh. my, reminded myself to ask Carolyn. But what was I just asking first? Dave Millett, you were saying? Oh, yeah. Ask about Dave Millett. Okay. I think that's his name. Dave Millett. That is a very interesting family. Very involved uh, with Christian Murdy from the before Worcester met Christian Murdy. Mm-hmm. And that overlaps with Bo Kitzelman. Mm-hmm. Bo Kitz, did you bring up Bo Kitzelman? Yeah, he, yeah, we didn't talk about it much, but he acknowledged. Yes, Bo Kitzelman and Dave Millett. You put those two together to get some of the history because if Rai was returning to essence of that, is that that's true? Right, um, Christian Murdy was the last mm-hmm. expression of a principality, mm-hmm. an awe, a religion, mm-hmm. and an importance, a significance. And he was the last guy, you know, acting out the Rai, but canceling Rai as yeah. he did it. Mm-hmm. And so these people involved with Christian Murdy in the 50s and early 60s is, it leads into cosmic awareness, and that's the interesting study of hypnosis. Mm-hmm. Because they talk about spiritual, or just hypnosis on a, a metaphysical archetypal level. Mm-hmm. McLuhan talks about it in empirical media terms, mm-hmm. and they interrelate. Mm-hmm. It's all about hypnosis. Mm-hmm. So what is hip-hop? Hip-hop is <laughs> hypnosis as art form. Gee, great. Great. The kids pretend to be hypnotized. <laughs> yeah, they just pretend to be hypnotized. They're putting yeah. on hypnosis. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, good. Oh, and that that brings in the very important Russian study. Um, it was Pavlov, I think, that Dave tells the story that Pavlov just told the, the Soviets mm-hmm. that if you hypnotize people like you're trying to do, it'll eventually... Uh, they will wake up to it, or it will flip into its opposite effect, and you'll never be able to hypnotize them again. Mm-hmm. That is part of the death of hypnosis mm-hmm. and, and the death of Rai. That mm-hmm. is something you got to ask about. The Pavlov, I think mm-hmm. i got to write Pavlov, what he told the Soviets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a very important point that Dave mm-hmm. brings up. Right, right. right. I will. Another story is, uh, I remember once in uh, 1980 at the airport as we were leaving L.A., he, he told me and Carol, an interesting, just brought up the story. He says, uh, anthropologists, uh, either this was a particular ancient tribe they were talking to, and they found significance of the fact that this tribe said they could solve everything in the ecology of their tribe, which went on you know, for thousands of years mm-hmm. in their, in their uh, zero-sum state sort of thing. They never could solve hate. Mm-hmm. Now, that's an interesting uh, thing, an mm-hmm. anthropological uh, anecdote that you might mm-hmm. want to ask him about what that means to him. Mm-hmm. Oh, well. Another thing is that Dave always said that you um, you have to learn, if you don't align power, sex, and money properly, you'll be a perverted person, a distorted person. Mm-hmm. Those three forces have to be aligned when you're moving into those levels, power, mm-hmm. sex, and money. So that, that's an interesting triad he talks mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. I must have done something wrong. <laughs> Which reminds me, you you need to... You know, when let him tell you about the. Here's another topic: the bank account. When Rai returned to Essence, mm-hmm. all the bank accounts that Rockefellers and Mellons had were emptied. They did not have the power of their accounts. Now, mm-hmm. Worcester explains this in better detail. I'm just overriding, summarizing it. And therefore, the plan, the grand design for an apocalyptic uh, Armageddon or a way of the elites, the Freemasons, Illuminati, controlling the uh, mm-hmm. the destruction and therefore still maintaining control and bringing in new world order, mm-hmm. that was off balance from 68 on. Mm-hmm. Now, I always take that fact, and that's why um, we've had almost little, like the, the war in June 67, the Israeli-Egyptian war, that could have been, er, Israeli-Arab Six-Day War, that could have been an apocalyptic thing. Reiner Galen was orchestrating that. That didn't work totally, and that's a few mm-hmm. months after Rye returned to Essence. Then the attempts to do, say, uh, Rex 84 didn't work. You know, all mm-hmm. those attempts of bringing in martial law on that, they were mm-hmm. off-key because there was no real foundation for them anymore. I always found it interesting that what that accountant, I guess you call him, of the Mellon family told you in 68, yeah. that they're going to create a depression and make it a privilege to work. Right? Yeah, they yeah. Have a work job. is a privilege and not a right. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah, privilege and not, a, not right. a right. Yeah, we're going to teach the workers work is a privilege and not a right. That's what he's Yeah. Now, that statement is after Rai returns to essence, and one could say, yes, they've implemented it, but you need to tell Worcester that statement and relate to Rai and see what he says about that. Okay. Okay. God, that's great, Bob. 
Yeah. That's great. That's one He's right an now. ongoing metaphysician that needs to be uh, listened to and thought about and relate to other things. Mm-hmm. Because he's uh, he's using the the principle of not having any power or not trying to hypnotize people, but he's looking at the hypnosis all around him and its disappearance and wh- how people still try to mm-hmm. uh, hypnotize. He has a very interesting take on Clinton. Mm-hmm. He told me in '93 uh, that would be um, mm-hmm. when were we there? The, the, the spring of '93. Clinton mm-hmm. had just got in. He says the Republicans, which is largely the doctors. Mm-hmm. have five years to reestablish control. Mm-hmm. In 98, they do Lewinsky. Oh, yeah. And now you have the Republicans back in power. Are they, uh, you know, vulnerable? Did they do it? Mm-hmm. Can they do it if there's Raid? There's no Raid. That's And so Worcester has an interesting, uh, ironic, humorous approach to these guys attempting to mm-hmm. retrieve their power. And they had five years, and it took them five years until they did Lewinsky on Clinton. Mm-hmm. So that's an interesting prediction. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the drug company and the AMA yeah, and all that. Yeah, like the high priest, right. the, the last gasp of right, yeah, the, yeah. The, the hypnosis of health. I want to ask him about the cortex and about the subconscious and about yeah. the uh, reptilian brain, the limbic system. See what he uh, says. He knows a lot about that. About that and about animal hypnosis. Which I'm ask him about the number 22 in the tarot cards, which he says this on Furry Lint. Um, who's forgotten Furry Lint, the long four-hour thing. Yeah. I think I have a tape. I used to tape him. I used to tape him without telling him, but he Uh-oh. didn't mind. But then yeah. I used to put some of it on the radio. Uh-oh. <laughs> but no, he didn't mind that. Oh. But the uh, he trusted me. But mm. he talks about how 22 came from yeah. this uh, this ancient knowledge, which was very complex or something. So the precursors, it's like the twi- uh, they have all this amazing knowledge way back there, and then it something destroys it so they crystallize it down to 22 cards or the tarot cards mm-hmm. I may have got that wrong but that's mm-hmm. something to ask them about mm-hmm. where, oh. where the major arcana and the minor arcana come from mm-hmm. yeah I will and the kahuna ring the kahuna ring yeah. was what went around the planet after Rai, re- Rai returned to essence in 19 19- it came through awareness in 1964 that there was five years Mm-hmm. to alter the design of the biblical apocalypse. Well, I, t- I touched on it from my point of view. What I heard from the <coughs> these ET presence or whatever, the higher presence that I was communicating with in 66, and he said, what now? Tell me. And he was really interested in that. We, then we said, he, has, he knows dates, and 66 is yeah. uh, resonant with him. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he was all, he was really right on... He's interested. Yeah, he's really interested. He pays attention. You yeah. tell him something. He wants to hear it. He absorbs any yeah. new wacko that comes into his life. Yeah. He absorbs. Right. Well, you know I'm not I mean? a wacko. We're wackos. I'm not a wacko. You I can know. be a wacko if you want to be, but I'm not a wacko. I don't want to be a wacko. We're, we're I think wacko. we live in a planet of wackos. Yes, well, we know that. You know, now, That's now here's, it occurred That's to me. why we're wackos. It occurred to me watching the outcome of that fucking guy. What, he's supposed to have killed his wife and kid, you know? Uh, you know. the Peterson. Yeah, it is the trial, how they fucking hung him in seven hours, you know, once once they got the jury adjusted correctly. <laughs> a little bit crooked there, boy. Yeah, you mean Lacey Peterson? Yeah, because it sounded to me like, it was, and even the expert pundit uh, analyst that attended the trial couldn't believe he was convicted. Oh, you mean he does? He's not guilty. He's, they found him guilty, but Jesus I know, but Christ, not he guilty. might not be guilty. Is what I'm is saying. That right? There's no fucking evidence. Right. That's it's right. just okay. all circumstantial and stuff. It's all crappy and it's like coincidental. And they don't believe in coincidences. Well, is it true that he lied to everybody? They well, caught him lying. Yeah, they caught. He lied about women. You know, he's this is yeah. American tradition. He fuck women on the side and you lie right. about it. Was he rich? Yeah. Okay. And so was she. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and okay. they try and you know try to they try to make that his, uh, uh, you know the re- the motive was he wanted her money. Right. That's why he killed her. I don't believe it. Okay, so wh- when I say wacko, we mean sub- we're sub geniuses, oh. and and a wacko is someone who pays attention uh, to what's going on to to things that other people, the normals, don't pay attention. Oh, okay, to. Is that what you mean? So when we show up, Dave pays attention. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, I Dave, told him. Hey, I told him about us seeing Shockley, but I couldn't get into that either. You know, you I just said you saw Shockley. No, we, you and I, went to see Shockley, Paul Shockley. Oh, you told him about that. I just said we went to see him, and we planted some shit, and it turned out in the the next uh, 
the next, yes. the next, next reading, the next letter he put out, you know. Yes. And he then one no one on one another. He said Shockley fucked up his life and was a thief and yeah, and, yeah. you know was a. Crook. We went there in it was during the Falklands War. It was yeah. March April eighty two. Was that when it was? Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was February March eighty two before Falklands happened in April. Mm-hmm. It, was a, it was a dark year. 82 was a dark year. It was a depression, you know, and mm-hmm. war and all that. Uh, if you want, But uh, you just brought up, there was something else. Here's another thing mm-hmm. he says. I forgot it, but and I remembered another thing. Uh, oh, yeah, he says he says he doesn't regard um, there's anybody else in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea that everything's disappeared, Dave lives it. He says it's very hard for him to find someone else in the world. Mm-hmm. But when we show up, Mm-hmm. He has a relationship because mm-hmm. we exist. Mm-hmm. You know, we have that intensity. Mm-hmm. So when you when you mention the, you know, sixty six, what's that? He wants to hear because he doesn't hear many real things or mm-hmm. things that have any energy of reality. Well, we were talking about that. We we spoke about you know, like I don't know exactly how we said it, but yeah. uh, wish it was on tape. But it was uh, uh, you know, like it's you know, you get to a certain point of enlightenment and it's really hard to find people that when you're when you're trying to express this they want to put you in the bell of you you know yeah, yeah. and that was my experience they wanted to lock me fucking up and sherry was in the leader of the gang she's now dying of cancer yeah i've heard that name sherry what, sherry she worked for rolling stone no she was my girlfriend and she was she did the east village and then she worked for evergreen grove press you know for, oh yeah but is, she's not the one she's not um, she, Wolf's mother. No, no, I didn't yeah. have any children with her. And when was Sherry I, your girlfriend? Uh, just before Peggy. But I, you know, she uh, at the EVO. She worked yeah, at the EVO. Yeah, she was there. No, she she's didn't. She's the one in avant garde. Yeah, she's the one in avant garde. Yeah. She's, <laughs> the, the she's the school teacher now. Right, yeah. right, right. So she's out in Tucson too. She's there. Yeah, and she's um, she had a child, one child. And, and when did she want to put you in Bellevue back then? Back in those, you know, during the forty day experience. She, right. She, yeah. Now here's the here's the timing of that. Yeah. That see, I mentioned you in when I send. Uh, White the uh, the book. Mm-hmm. There'll be the memo of Prince Charles, which goes into your four day your forty day mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. I talk about that in the memo of Prince Charles. Great. Now here's why I always want to bring you and Worcester together. Mm-hmm. Is that is the period when Doobie is going nuts in Hawaii, mm-hmm. trying to set up a new cult, right. and he's having he's going to have heart attacks and die. Right. That intense that was an intense period for Dave because he withdrew from the group and yeah. dropped out of it through sixty mm-hmm. six. Mm-hmm. And then in early 67, which is around the time that you were on your 40 days or ending it, mm-hmm. um, he, uh, right, he dies. Then Worcester is still laying low, and then they come to him in the summer of 67. So mm-hmm. the intent you guys both had, see, I think that you were miming some level of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, if it's true what came through Cosmic Awareness, you were picking up on the death of Rai in your 40-day wacko, mm-hmm. or 40-day uh, trip. You know what I'm saying? Well, I don't know. I you know I didn't. I wasn't introduced to anybody named Rai. And um, <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't. I did. And and I, but I was in touch with some really incredible intelligence that it was made you very humble because of its brilliance and compassion. And, right. And uh, you know, it, it 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 questioned me like I was a beta station or beta, right. uh, you know, like uh, computer like program, huh? Question you like me? Yeah, like you. But I mean, <laughs> more like. But but. But even more. Well, well. You know, you you couldn't. You know, apparently you, you haven't demonstrated uh, total transparency. I mean, I'm not totally transparent to you yet. Right. They but questioned you, even though they knew everything about you. They knew everything. They knew the answers before I gave them. You know? <laughs> and, but all they were looking for was the right answers. Is what they were looking. Okay. For. Here's. I didn't finish this other thought. Yeah. Um, so, in, so the awareness said in '63 or '64, early '64, that there was five years to for and enlightened minds to do something mm-hmm. in, on the planet mm-hmm. to alter the Armageddon, traditional Armageddon scenario that the Bible imprinted every, into everybody, that it would start happening in 69, 70, 71, if mm-hmm. something didn't happen. So from 64, 69, that five-year period, mm-hmm. all kinds of things burst out. You can go from Fritz, Fritz Perls to Esland. McLuhan burst out in 64. Mm-hmm. He was a post rye thinker. And Worcester and them are doing all that mediumship mm-hmm. with Doobie in that mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. That's another thing to ask about this, the march, the march from '64 to '69, because mm-hmm. Rai returns to Essence '67, but the apex of polarity is September 5th, '69, mm-hmm. and that's a very interesting thing that happens then. Mm-hmm. And that's the acting out of this uh, 
siphoning off of this historical pattern, stereotype, archetype that was inevitable mm-hmm. if humans didn't sort of try to do wake people up by not trying to be a religion and, and redoing a hypnosis, which was the principle you were operating on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wake them up without trying to turn it into a new uh, cult. Yeah, hypnosis. oh yeah, fuck yeah. This is... It was so art. TV and McLuhan showed how TV did that. TV was transparency. Nobody mm. could control a TV environment. Yeah. Only well, I've, that's the nature of the information age. Is yes. that when information travels at the speed of light, there is no propriety. There's no city. Right. Uh, it's everywhere at once. Right. And uh, and you can't control things with that. And also, you better just walk around because not only is the the emperor naked, everybody's naked. Right. You know. And so. now that the, the, the McLuhan dealing with that fact. Yeah. And and relating the traditional Rai uh, power through print. Yeah. The, what's the role of the old print uh, cover up in relation to that? That's what uh, Joyce and McLuhan worked on, and do and Worcester worked on it metaphysically mm-hmm. through cosmic awareness readings. Mm-hmm. They had the same point. Why mm-hmm. have a religion when everybody's all at one? Yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 so the I always found it interesting as I had more and more yeah. in the sixties and seventies. Yeah. That what awareness said that Rai returned to essence that that most amazing fact. Mm-hmm. Who would believe that it happened in January sixty seven? And here's a medium saying this, and yet if you once you understood McLuhan, you realize that it happened externally. Yeah, yeah. Not only on the inner plane. So yeah. there's proof that awareness was not lying. Right, right. That we we spent thirty to forty years trying to adapt to the fact there's no secrecy and all the principalities, iconically known as the CIA. And they haven't got it yet. They and they well. What's interesting? That's the cobwebs of Rai. Yeah. And Dave's commenting on that. Mm-hmm. Him laughing at those that don't get it and yeah. how it falls away. Yeah. But here's what he told me in '93: oh. that once we now know, we want to get it clear. We know Rai's return to essence, but we don't know what part of man that Rai created survives that. Uh-huh. And that's what we're doing. We've been doing for 30 years, trying to find out what survives that. Uh-huh. What part of print? You see this in McLuhan's writings. He says, uh-huh. the all a new medium obsolesces all the older media. So what is valuable of the older society, the older medium? It's what has relevance and predicts the future. That, that was one of his answers. Mm-hmm. Predicts the fate of itself. Mm-hmm. That is, the, that is uh, he says, the artist knows what to save from the old environment. Mm-hmm. He would adjust it to the new. So there's McLuhan working out in terms of culture the very drama of what we do when there are no secrets. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing to say, and everybody's integrated. What, do, what, what does man do and humans and women do then? Mm-hmm. And yeah. so then the closing of the womb is genetic engineering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the womb with a vu. <laughs> The one with a vu, yeah. yeah. Now, it, 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 I always, yeah. The the interesting thing about that is, I always Worcester loved this movie. It came out in the eighties, yeah. and uh, I'm not sure if it's Room with a View, but oh. he cites that. But I never know. Um, oh. Oh. I haven't ever got this straight. I have to find out what. Yeah, no, there was, was a movie. There was a movie. Oh yeah, it was a movie. Yeah. It's yeah. one of those you know eighties yeah. novels. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the, you know, yeah, it's a think, mom yeah. novel or something. Mm. It, what it, the movie I'm thinking of? Yeah. The ugly maid, yeah. the ugly woman, who's an idiot through the whole movie. In mm-hmm. the end, she saves the game. Oh. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a sign that you know everybody's equal. Everybody mm-hmm. has a role, mm-hmm. even though she's a dupe and a doofus. Mm-hmm. So I got to find out what that movie is and if that's what worse I mean because he cites uh, one of, yeah. a room with a view. Write mm-hmm. that down. Is that the movie or oh, maybe uh, okay. come off? Yeah. But that's a phrase he used. Well, I've already got tomorrow's interview lined up. <laughs> yeah. I got I got more than I can write. No, but you'll do more interviews. Yeah, I know. I I look forward to it. Yeah, I, he's an amazing guy, and uh, I hope he sends me the tapes. Have you got those tapes? The well, uh, audio tapes of the uh, thirteen tapes of. Um, his oh, of the courses? Yeah. The development classes? Yeah, no, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't never had them. I just went through them. Oh, you did that. Okay, wait a minute. And then the last one. Well, here's the story with that. Wait a second. Well, okay, the last one was called the Golden Cloak Ritual. Here's what, oh, yeah, I didn't tell you this. No. Mm-hmm. The whole, you have all these people interested, Robert Anton Wilson interested in Aleister Crowley. Mm-hmm. Now, Crowley set up the last gasp of the Rai function. Mm-hmm. And cosmic awareness came through Doobie to undo the order of the Golden Dawn. Uh-huh. 
Remember, Krishnamurti left that same world, too. Mm-hmm. He left that world. Right. The theosophy, right. the theosophical society, the Oracle Don, the Crowley world, all those right. New Age bullshit. And you see, you know, Anton LaVey and these guys, they go into it and, right. and do wacky stuff with it. Right. And they're wallowing around trying to cre- keep Rai going. Mm-hmm. So w- this is what always struck me about the neat metaphysics of, of uh, awareness and what it said and what works to represent it mm-hmm. is that he was a counter-environment to Robert Anton Le Wilson and Leary. Great. They, Who was? Worcester? Worcester. Is. Oh, great. That's what he is, because God he came to awareness it. to dismantle the Order of the Golden Dawn yeah. and the Crowley thing, and that's all that Wilson did, Yeah. was to keep the Crowley myth going. That's right. And he's the surface, acceptable pink version of Worcester. Yeah. And Worcester, so so there it is, the Order of the Golden Dawn and the Golden Cloak. So, yeah. so we took these courses yeah. in 6970, and we mm-hmm. got up to class number 10. Mm-hmm. And Carol and I and another guy decided to drop out oh. because we thought um, there was a potential of becoming a member of a cult. So we dropped out of it, yeah. and that was six, that was 70. So mm-hmm. then we never finished the courses. Uh-huh. So in 74, at the, at the uh, get-together, they used to call them the August Affair, mm-hmm. in a place called Clearwater outside Seattle, mm-hmm. um, or Clearview, Clearview, Clearview. Yeah, Clearview. one with a view. Um, yeah. They, uh, we showed up a week, a-, a few days after the big gathering, where Shockley and Avaton nailed Dave. Uh-huh. We missed all that. We showed up late. We always showed up at the right up time. September twenty. What? <laughs> you showed up at the right time. We always show up after. See, Carol and I, we represent the the new, the new. So yeah. we, you know, the George Washington of the new plane of existence. Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Said a lot the <laughs> now you're meeting one of the uh, George Washington's mentor. That's you know right. what I mean? That's Who it. understands yeah. it. That's right. yeah. so, so we showed up after the polarity in September 1569, which was the date that Dweezil Zappa's kid was born. Mm-hmm. Zappa's uh, uh, second kid, the son. Yeah. Yeah. But we show up September 25th, 26th, and after the big polarity. Then we show up in five years later, in 74, after the big battle between... Um, Shockley and Worcester, mm-hmm. but um, now why was I telling you that? The uh, oh, so uh, Worcester and Vern, his gay uh, lover, the guy who organized the development classes, ran them and ran the seances or whatever the channelings. When Dave went in trance, Vern was the uh, his name was Vern Christensen. He became Chris Christensen. Mm-hmm. He, he liked the name Chris better later. Mm-hmm. But he said, Bob and Carol must have, we, they, didn't, they forgot that we weren't development ministers. So we had to take the 11th course. So they set up the tape, and a few other people joined in. We started to do the ritual, and the tape machine broke. Uh huh. So Carol and I always took that as a message. There was no way we were going to be fucking processed like that, because we didn't need to. Yeah. And uh, that was that, and that's always been a joke between Dave and I, that we never got totally processed. <laughs> Well, he said all kinds of things, strange things happen with the last, um, the golden, what did I say? What is it called? The golden. So I never did the 13th. There's 12 uh, classes, yeah. and then there's this the master the, class. Yeah, the uh, graduate, it's, he called it the graduation Yes. ritual. He called it the graduation ritual. And strange things would happen when they would do it. Yeah, and he said yeah. after they did it, boom, all kinds of shit would happen. Yeah, no, they, they acted out. Yeah. What they did is they did the fun. They replayed the yeah. original yeah. principality and occult rituals going back yeah. thousands of years, yeah. but did it with a new consciousness of right. not to make a trip out of it. Right. A, a power thing, and therefore they siphoned it off. Yeah. And then you have all these cults that surface after that Scientology, the Moonies, trying to do that, mm-hmm. and they just become ridiculous. Yeah. And so that awareness was the best cult because they didn't try to be a cult. Right. And they understood what they were doing. Mm-hmm. They were consciously. Dave always advocated conscious mediumship, not yeah. going into trance. That's why he right. he uh, doesn't like uh, hearing much about the evergreens because the guy's still in trance. Yeah. So it's always been an interesting interplay. Yeah. Between the evergreens and cosmic awareness in my life. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to get more. Uh, uh, you know, once he finds out that I'm uh, a serious thirty-year student of. The language of the subconscious, if you want yeah. to call it that, or whatever the fuck you want to call it, uh, yeah. he'll uh, maybe start talking more technical. Well, te- that's what you want. That's technically what to me, you know, because yeah. this is just the first one is just preliminary. Do you know this yeah. one? Do you know that? One? It's like getting acquainted, you know. Yeah, no, that's good. Probably yeah. good that you didn't tape it. Yeah. Um, just remember well, I, some of. Some I did of the, the best I might... could, Bob. What? I did the best I could. You know? No, but what's good though is that you made yeah. notes. Yeah. Someday, mm-hmm. maybe not in tomorrow's interview, but you come back and say, "What did you say then?" And then yeah. you'll say it again. Right? Yeah. Oh, he'll repeat himself. Then you get on on tape. 
Yeah. So it, how did it end? Well, After it ended. Hours. It, it, it ended. I had to piss really bad because yeah. my bladder is not uh, what it used to be. And he was muy sympathetic. He's, you know, he had can, he had prostate problems and all kinds yeah. of shit too. So. Yeah, he's had some health problems. And it you. turns out, my, my dear friend though, that flies the helicopter in front of Mount Rushmore, Bruce, right. Bruce, he fucking didn't tell me a thing about it. He went in and had a, he's got a scar in, my, in his belly, like just like mine. They probed him, and and he, they thought it was uh, prostate cancer. How do you know he he didn't tell you? How do well, you he know just that? told me now on the phone. I just, I just got in touch with him yesterday, and he told me the story. What was his name, Bruce? Bruce. Bruce Schiltz is his name, yeah. you got to ask David about... Um, He's a channeler. He channels stuff, Bruce. Right. Here's the here's the other story. While Dave was in... I don't know if he met him in Lake Elsinore, but definitely in Venice. Mm-hmm. In, in, his, in the 80s. Mm-hmm. He got involved with a guy, I can't remember his name, who uh, was a major guy in the Hughes organization. Mm. And that is an incredible story. Okay. I, will, I'm not gonna... I think his name's Jesse or something. Or Jesse was his friend. Uh-huh. Um, uh, Jesse's uh, boss. Um, you want to hear about that guy because he had millions, and, and he used to be very fascinated with Dave's metaphysics. And, uh, uh-huh. and you know, really uh, was very involved with Dave. But he told Dave a lot about what was going on in, in power structures. Oh, yeah. States. Right. So the Hughes guy is, is a great story, and there's um, I don't okay. oh oh yeah here here's a great one. Right. The Dave you can tell in his life he touched on everything. Yeah. In the in the early fifties he's down in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. So guess who he spent a night with? Who? Clay Shaw. God damn. He touched on that circle because of the gay network, and Clay was gay. Mm-hmm. And then later the Kennedy assassination happened, and, and he uh, recognized these people as the information came out. He remembered wow. them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I think he also spent a night with with Tennessee Williams or one of those. Mm-hmm. Oh no, uh, Truman Capote, I think. Oh, okay. Anyway, so he so he interacts with Clay Shaw. He uh-huh. does a remote viewing in, in '62, uh-huh. the Cuban Missile Crisis. He sees that, mm-hmm. and. Uh, then the Kennedy assassination happens. And then in 1970, he's driving across America and doing his lectures, and he shows up in Worcester, Massachusetts, <laughs> named after him. And yeah. that's where Abby Hoffman grew up, oh, really? Worcester, Massachusetts. Oh, really? And I think it's there that he saw Nixon in yeah. a crowd. Really? And he, it's very interesting uh, how Dave describes the Nixon in person. Found him a very uh, powerful person, mean mm-hmm. person. You know what I mean. He mm-hmm. didn't have a good TV image, yeah. but uh, so he touches. He sees. He sees Nixon. He always mm-hmm. touched on. Uh, he helped design uh, early spacecraft. Uh, he told me that. He told me just touched on that. Yeah. You know. Uh, now you know. I have. Jerry may have a copy. I was just looking at the other day. I just got it out. I got Dave to send me. Mm-hmm. If you ever go up there. Have him show you the two-hour interview I did with him. Oh, really? It's called the Blacked Out History of something, of the 20th century. And we go through all these stages from 1956 in the Haunted House up to uh, 1988 when we did it. And that was in a in little nightclub place during the day in uh, Santa Monica, in Venice. And uh, that's a pretty good interview. And it shows Dave playing music. Oh, and, really? Uh, we taped him playing the piano. He's a very good piano player. And he's apparently a painter, too, huh? Yeah. yeah. And Vern was a painter. Dave can do he can do most arts or anything. That's know? great. It's amazing he doesn't write, though. I guess you know the impulse. Well, it's too slow. It's yeah, obsolete. It's too slow. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I would say that he... Rep- Remember, McLuhan once asked, why did Socrates, Jesus Christ, and someone else never write? Mm-hmm. Well, we've got to the point where the writing world is over. Yeah. And Worcester, as a meta- metaphysician, is understanding the present, doesn't focus too much on reading. Mm-hmm. He doesn't as focus on writing. He lives in the present, which mm-hmm. is always being manufactured post yeah. Rai. Right. He's tuned into the present. Mm-hmm. So the other weird phenomenon is that Worcester and I, starting in 1976, every now and then we'd get together and an earthquake would happen. Uh-huh. So that's an interesting well, thing. Well, just stay out of there. Just don't go see him as long as I'm in San Francisco. Right. Okay? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. no, I will. I won't. Don't. <laughs> Let me get out of here first. Yeah. The um, 
the final one in remember when the, the big earthquake up in Vancouver in Olympia, Washington? Yeah. That's an amazing story. In I think it's like two thousand I don't know what year it was, it's over three or four years ago. Mm-hmm. Maybe two thousand one. Mm-hmm. Um he and Paul Shockley get together. They finally meet up after like since nineteen eighty six, oh, really? fourteen years later. Really? And by that time, Shockley is almost apologizing for what he did because all the bullshit that happened to him, oh. and he's broken off with Avaton, who set this up in '74. Uh-huh. And um, so Dave is hearing all this bad news about Paul and and, and Avaton. So Dave says, "Someone ought to give that guy a whack, something like that, uh-huh. some phrase like that." So he uh-huh. goes back to Seattle, and about six weeks later, a huge earthquake happens near Olympia, Washington. And up up down Vancouver area, mm-hmm. and it knocks out the dome in Olympia, Washington. And Olympia, Washington is one of the first places awareness started mm-hmm. in that area in the 60s when they mm-hmm. first started to have the organization. And the epicenter, the center of the earthquake, was five miles from uh, Avaton's house. Mm-hmm. Wow. So it's like Dave said, someone ought to smack that guy, and then he got smacked. Mm-hmm. The whole area got mm-hmm. smacked. Mm-hmm. Now, Dave doesn't make any significance out of it. He, he laughs at me making... Yeah. Uh, pseudo significance out of it. Yeah. I mean, I bring this up and mention it to yeah. him, and he he listens to it, finds it interesting, but he doesn't identify with it. Mm-hmm. Finds it curious. But I would say, if there was a reality to it, when Dave and I get together, we siphon off a bit of the Earth Armageddon energies. Yeah. So an earthquake happens, you know, off in a side place or something. Yeah. Doesn't happen in New York City, or or San Francisco or LA. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm still so writing, I think you were. I'm still writing that. notes. <laughs> right. I, yeah. I, I think. Yeah, writing right. is slow. I'll tell you. <laughs> real slow. Yeah, it's real slow. Yeah. Right. Um, I think you were intuiting that on your trip in uh, sixty and sixty-six. I think you were inco- you were encountering the hypnosis factor mm-hmm. in consciousness, metaphorized yeah. well, as being. I didn't tell you this. I told Dave this, but a deal. We were, our our talk was so fragmented. It was like we were speaking. Clumps of shorthand to each other. Yeah, all over the place. Yeah. Hopping around. Yeah, hopping around. And click, clear click, light. Click, yeah. Anyway, uh, um, what, was it? what did you say? You, you said you didn't tell me what you told Dave. All right, what, before that, what I, did I you was say? saying about uh, siphoning off your... Oh, your trip. You met the, hip, the original Rai hypnosis on your 66-day trip. Mm-hmm. The hypnosis of a, of a so-called uh, superior being. That's what I said, and then you yeah. said, oh, I didn't. God damn, I don't know what I was thinking. Well, I'll redo the idea. The, the yeah. hypnosis. When, as Rai is returning to essence, mm-hmm. you're um, uh, you're interacting with this tran- this being that can see you, mm-hmm. see everything about you. Mm-hmm. To me, uh, there are beings that can do that, but that in matter, mm-hmm. that is a hypnotic factor, mm-hmm. a radiation. Oh, that's it. You got it. Okay. Uh, I just learned this in L.A. last year. I met this guy that uh, produced, he produced, uh, among other things, um, that movie on Van Gogh, Starry Starry Night. Right. It wasn't about Van Gogh, but it was about, you know, something about it. And he did the UFO movie that he filmed in Bisbee. You mean the one, uh, the one on Crop Circles? or The last UFO, the, the, uh, Roswell. The movie, oh, yeah, yeah. The movie Roswell. Uh, and uh, he's an interesting guy, and he gave me a book he wrote. That's uh, you know he, he writes he couches it as a novel, you know, and it's the story of him and this other guy being guinea pigs at the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Research Institute at Princeton in 1965. You mean a drug? Drug hypnosis? You mean uh, what kind of guinea pig and what kind? Of yeah, hypnosis? what they were doing is they were giving people. LSD, and they were relating LSD, the LSD state, they were studying the LSD state as it relates to the hypnotic state. Right. And, you know, where trance is and all that other shit. Did Dave mention Hubbard? Because that's what Hubbard did with the psychic group there in Seattle. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Captain L. Hubbard. Captain L. He didn't mention that. Yeah, he did mention that, but uh, he didn't mention relating to that. But Hubbard what? wanted to give LSD to psych- very advanced psychic like, people like yeah. Worcester, and he did it. No, this was stuff. this was a this was a study that they were did for a this number more mainstream a number of years. Yeah, and it was National Institute of Mental Health funded by CIA is what it was. Right. <clears throat> anyway, and uh, 
He writes a novel about that. He's got the book, and it's you know he it's a story about him and this guy and all they learn. And Osmond was right in the middle of it. Humphrey Osmond, you know. Humphrey Osmond, right? Yeah, yeah. he's the guy that coined the term psychedelic. He's the guy that gave me the, gave me the antidote. Well, he may have turned me on to that fucking forty day shit too, because that was. Oh, you wrote to him, right? I went and saw him in person, Alan Ginsberg, before I went and testified for the Congress. I said, look, look you're going to testify to Alan Ginsberg. And, uh, yeah. Leary is going to testify, and Art Kleps is going to testify. and you know, those, That's enough positive input. What, do you, what could I say that would be different? He says, well, why don't you go talk to Humphrey Osmond over there in New, Jer- New Jersey? You know, and he told me the thing, and I went over and talked to him. And he gave me a PIQ test. First, first, I told he told me about his trips. Yeah, you know which were amazing, um, unicorns and you know <laughs> amazing stuff. I didn't believe it at all. You know, and he's a funny looking guy. He's a short. He? He's a short Englishman. That's what he is. You know? Gnomic. Yeah, no, he's great though. He's got a lot of energy. And he's real enthusiastic and bright guy. And it was a pleasure meeting him and spending that time with him. You know, he talked a little bit about Huxley and you know. Well, there you have that in comic because Worcester met Humphrey. I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, and so I didn't get. That's another thing we skimmed across the top of yeah. and wanted to. Talk. You actually like re- you introduced all the areas that you will go into. Yeah, later. Yeah, you know, just we were just gabbing. Anyway, and um, he told you stories. Then he gave you a P. Uh, I- he gave me this PIQ test, which is 200 true false false questions. And what does P stand for? Uh, personality index quotient is what it stands for. Right. And uh, it was 200 true false questions. He, and when the people came to give me the antidote from o- Osmond's office, having met me at a party, not knowing me, hearing my story about... No, no wait, I'm, I'm, you're with Osmond. No, I, I went to see Osmond. Okay, give me the PIQ test. He talked into my tape recorder. I talked into his tape recorder. We sw- swapped tall tales about uh, psychedelic experiences. And you left. And I left and then testified for Congress, you know. Now you're talking about a party. Afterwards, the guy comes down from Washington and tries to warn me not to take any acid, but he says, don't have anything to do with any drugs. Well, I wasn't a dope dealer, and I right. didn't really have anything to do with drugs because the things that I'm interested in are herbs and foods. Right. <laughs> You know, right. Not drugs, you know. And this came to you after you testified. Uh, the guy warned you. me. He said they're going to get you. Don't have anything to do for another six months with any drugs. They're going to get you gonna, after you testified. They're going to get me. Yeah. yeah. Who? I said. He says it's a leak. I don't know. He, I but said, the guy said it to you after you drew attention to yourself in Washington. No, this was the guy that was the editor of the Green Book in Washington, that they write after all these things. You know, the Green Book on the testimony. You know. I don't right. Know but did he? He was he, a former reporter in New York. I know. But did he tell you this after you've testified? After I've testified. He called me from and Washington and made an appointment for lunch. And I thought, he says, I want to take you out to lunch. I says, what would you like to eat? I'll make the arrangements. And he says, I just got something to share with you, and I need a noisy restaurant. I don't, need, <laughs> I don't care about the food I'm not going to eat. Right. So we went next door from the East Village, other downstairs from the Fillmore East, and we, what was it, Katz's or Cantor's or one of those Jewish delicatessen where the waiters are always pissed off, you know, yeah. and they throw the dishes into the thing, you know, making loud noises, and we sat right next to where the dishes were being thrown. So the whole time it's like noise. And he says, don't have anything to do with any acid for the next six months. I said, why? He said, well, they're going to try to get you. And I said, who? He says, I can't tell you. It's a leak. I said, how? I said, I don't know. It's a leak. It just leaked to me. I thought I'd warn you. And this would be the spring of 66? This was um, probably August, maybe, of, right. of 66. It when could... I'm in California. Yeah, August. I'm in California that month. Probably August. And then by September, I saw, I forgot all about it after that. Yeah. And I saw in September in the newspaper that October 6th was the day they were going to make LSD a Class 1 felony. Right. So I said to Rod McDonald, who was the guy that ran the Gaslight Cafe in New York, that it, and Bob Dylan had been, or actually whose name was Robert Zimmerman, was playing guitar there. Uh, in, in September sixty. Uh, no, no, no. Whenever it had been. Whenever this was, you know, he squirts. This is Rod McDonald's claim to fame. He squirts an eyedropper full of clear 
uh, pharmaceutical acid, like 2,000 micrograms of rocket fuel, into Dylan's drink. Oh. Dylan doesn't know it. It's the drink and becomes Bobby Zimmerman. Uh, he becomes Bob Dylan. He right. comes, changes from Bobby Zimmerman to Bob Dylan. And that'd be about five years before. Yeah, or whatever it was. No, not, I don't think it was five years, but I think it was maybe you know in the early 60s. Oh, it's, yeah, well, if it's 66, yeah. it's 61. He becomes Bob Dylan, and his albums come out in 61, 62, his oh, first album. Okay, 62. Uh, okay, but 61. He probably, and the yeah. acid he probably got from Worcester Circle out in San Francisco. Yeah, 60 maybe is when he did it. Okay. Right. So anyway, um, that's his claim of fame, and he was into distributing everything. He distributed the Village Voice before he came to work for these village other but he was distributing his little sideline was de- dealing drugs you know and so, he distributed the east village other yeah mm-hmm. but he but he ran the cafe well he sold that by the time he got to work for the village voice and then a few years later he came to work for the east village other so he's older than you yeah he's quite a few years older yeah and uh, he's a he's a scotman a really dour man you know but a great guy, straight business, didn't have to keep accounts. And he followed me around with a bag of money and paid all my bills. You know, it was really great. Right off the top. So he, anyhow, so uh, he... Uh, he had the drugs on the side. He did his little. I didn't know that. But I said to him, but, you know, rumor gets around. I said, Rod, have you seen any good LSD uh, lately? Because it says in the paper here they're going to make it a class one felony in a few weeks. <clears throat> and he says, no, but a guy offered me a free sample the other day. And I said, really? It's going, you know, was, it, was it any good? He says, oh, he says, it's the best he's ever found. I said, why don't you get some from him? See if you still got it. A free sample of we don't know what it is. Uh, we called it acid, right? Right. We called everything acid. Right. So it was, it was sort of like, supposedly, LSD-like. Yeah, and I asked him, is this good? And he said, yeah. He says, this doesn't look like LSD. He says, believe me, the guy says it's great, you know. So he took a pill. You know, big capsules. And no, the guy already told you he took it. Oh, oh wait. The Rob is telling you this other guy said it was great. Yeah, and then and now Rob, you guys have and it. And now we have it, it. And Rob took it, and I took two big capsule, big fucking horse capsules, <laughs> and everybody else took one. And two guys went nuts and went to Bellevue. And <laughs> one guy is still on psych meds to this day. The last I checked in. What happened to Rob? Well, he didn't even fuck. It was like it didn't even phase him. I mean. <laughs> He said it was just, I, I described the trip. He was with me when the bird flew in the window and all the shit right. happened. And he was the there. Your, huh? That's the beginning of your 40-day trip. Yeah, he was there. And, we walking down, and we're walking down the street after I already died and reborn that night, right? We go over to the office. He wants to go over to the office for some reason. We go for a walk. We're walking down the... Uh, uh, after you died or he died? You after died. I died. And he brought me back to life, you know. Right. He said, arise Lazarus and started me <laughs> laughing. You know? Is sure, it you, Rod R-O-D or R-O-B is a R-O-D. Rod? His rod and his staff to guide him. Yeah, and that's the way it was. That's what I thought of it. You know, that's right. Rodney staff guided you through. And guided me back. through, yeah. And that's like 12 hours later you took it, after you took it? No, this is like two hours afterwards. Right. We go out in the street, and I'm walking down the street with him, and there's this guy in a neat cashmere um, long coat and a crew cut. And he's, not, you know, he's 5'11 or something, as I remember. Distinctive looking face, kind of with a dimple on the side. You know, he looks like a Gemini type guy head. And um, he and uh, Rod says, "Well, hi," and he goes, "Hi," right, and walks by like he doesn't want to talk to him. And I get nothing but ding, 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 cop bells, right? Because this guy was like probably in late, probably in his late fifties, you know. Anyway, and I said, and we walked on down the road. I said, "Who's that?" And he says, "That's the guy that gave us the free samples." <laughs> And in 1973 or whatever it was in that area, era, I saw his picture in the paper when he died, and that was Colonel George White. Yeah, the guy who said he loved to uh, do everything in the sea. I kill people. Right. He, was, he said, yeah. where, you know, where can you have more fun? And, yeah, you know. that famous quote. Yeah, famous quote. So he, he, I mean, you didn't, okay, you didn't know who he was till I, then? I didn't know who he was until I saw him his, his obit in the paper. And... um you know, and then Os- and that, uh, I'd seen Osmond before, and then afterwards, I'm in, at this party. I'm thinking of committing suicide. And uh, um, uh, okay, so you f- you felt when you felt after a couple of hours that you weren't going to die, and then Rod brought you back. I died. No, no, experience? I didn't think I was go- not going to die. I died. Was that a negative experience? 
No, it's like a liberating experience. Oh, okay, but now a few hours you later... You go down a tunnel and there's a sphinx and a bunch of lights and all kinds of great shit. And but but you're saying that a few hours later you had a party. And no, 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 it wasn't a few hours later. It was a few weeks later. I'm at the party. I've all gone through all this shit. I'm right in the middle of the 40 days. You mean you're still stoned? Well, I didn't get off of the the real effect of the thing for two and a half years. Right, but, but, but for, within for, the 40 days, you're just feeling good or something? 40 days, no, I'm peaked out seeing, I'm, you know, I'm, I wish I compared notes to this, too. We, right. And, you know, like I told him, I was com thinking of committing suicide because I'm living outside my body. And how long, when did yeah. that happen? Two months later? No, a month this, later? this was like a couple weeks later. Maybe. Right, and Three. you're in a party feeling this No, way. no, no. And then I went through this whole thing where I'm standing in my loft with a loaded 38 in my head. I'm oh. going to blow my fucking brains out. Right. And and I swear to God, it was George Byrne before he made the movie, Oh God. But it sounded just like God speaking in George Byrne's voice, right. saying, Thou shalt not kill anything, stupid. And when he said stupid, I knew he was talking to me. And the whole my lives, all of my lives triggered and flickered in front of me, ran like a film. And I saw myself standing there with the 38, and it went on into the future. And I saw my surgery and my death. And they said, no, we're going to intervene here, and you're going to have another 20 years. So I went into this surgery with uh, with that belief, you know, that this was just... The surgery you, you had that, uh, last year. That I just had on January 8th, last. Past. Right. Um, it's this year. That, it's this year. Which I think is Elvis's birthday or something. January 8th is? Yeah. Right. Um, on that surgery you saw back in 66. Yeah. You were yeah. saying. Yeah, and I okay. saw my whole life, you know. Everything before and after that, until I'm 84 or 5 or something. Like that. Right, that's where you get the 84 thing. Cause yeah. I and, and it's one cycle of Uranus, and I was born with Uranus conjunct the sun, just con, just uh, coincidentally, which I didn't know any of this at the time. You know, right. That came all later, that knowledge. I know out. you died at 84, and I was thinking that last year when I was, they were saying that you might die. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, how does this fit in with that? But uh -huh. you're saying that in the vision, they would let you live another 20 yeah, years. Yeah, they gave me. The they said, we're going to intervene to give you another 20 years. And I'm telling you, this experience I had with the surgery and everything was like an alien showed up, a little 35-year-old woman, yeah. that, that you know, named Rama Murthy. You know, this a department head of this whole fucking hospital, this college thing, and and how the hell? And she's got a she's got a little baby, and her husband is a um, uh, open heart sur you know, major heart surgery guy down in San Diego, and she's misses because he didn't get to see her baby growing up because he's never home. Right. So she he wants her to come down and she. Wants Wants him to come up, and he, but they started out here, and he's got a better job down there, and the climate's better. So she goes. Finally, she left, and she went down there. <coughs> but no, she was there just. I was her last real oh, client, and she yeah. says to everybody, "I know you're going to come through this, you know." Because she told everybody. She told everybody, and she told me, and she said, "I've seen a lot of people, and I all I've never been wrong in this." So that was before I went into surgery. When I went into surgery and I come out and went on to the effects of Versed, which is an interesting CIA drug, she says, the first thing she says to me is, well, it's malignant, and I'll, but I'll tell you about it tomorrow. <laughs> you know? And I couldn't remember if she said it was benign or malignant. Right. <laughs> you know, I couldn't, I couldn't, when would she told me it was malignant, I didn't believe that she said that because I didn't, uh, you know, that ain't going to get me. I know that. And she knew that, too, because she got everything out of it. And she says, you don't do, need to do the radiation and the chemo, you know. She got it out by her surgery. Yeah. Yeah. She said, well, no, I mean, the, the prostate cancer is an entirely different thing. Right. And, it, and I wouldn't let them uh, do a biopsy until everything else was over. Yeah, and, and what she's working on is that weird bladder thing you were talking she about. She worked on the bl bladder. And, and yeah. well, I had this. She took out 18 inches of the colon, too. Right. With that, uh, that big. Uh, so, but back to la you're back at the party. So I'm telling him I'm committing suicide, and he's and um, um, uh, Worcester, and he says I've been there, done that, you know. <laughs> so he said that two or three times when we were talking, but yeah. Um, 
anyway, so I, I'm, I'm at a party telling somebody about how I got to, you know, like Huxley, you know, did this, and he came, and they had seances, and then he pushed a book off and told them his, Laura about the other side, you right. know. And uh, I said, I want to do something like that to set up an experiment. I'm just not going to waste my life, you know, but already God had told me I was stupid, you know. You had already had that vision. Already had still that happen. Doing it maybe, but still, I'm thinking about it, you know. Yeah. And, and the lady sitting next to me, who was I was introduced to, somebody or other, uh, she says, "What's your name?" And I told her. And she says, "You know, Doctor Osmond's been talking about you lately." I said, "Really? Yeah, he saw you in London, and he saw you here in this place, and that, and I'd been astral traveling to all these places." Right. You know, and there were other people that showed up and and, and confirmed my experiences as actual, you know. <laughs> that, oh, yeah, somebody did jump on the table and take off their clothes. There was some shit, you know, right. whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and... Um, and so she says, "Don't have it, don't do anything until I get there, and I'll be there tomorrow." And she did show up right on time, called everything, and made her. Don't answer. do anything in terms of killing yourself. Yeah, anything. Don't do anything. Yeah. So <laughs> she showed up. Yeah, she shows up with this guy, her husband, I think it was, and they were part of the Osmond, Humphrey Osmond's uh, uh, group that experimented with. Um, uh, alcoholism, curing alcoholism with psychedelics. Yeah, that the documentary I was telling you, but I got yeah. footage of that. Really? Yeah, up in uh, Saskatchewan. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, no, they were doing a New Jersey Neuropsychiatric they Research continued it there, Institute right. at Princeton. Yeah, that's, yeah that they was, continued it. There. That was this one, you know. Yeah, that was always the cover. We're helping alcoholics. Yeah, and yeah, it was great. And <laughs> and anyway, she says that. So she gives me this big t- big jar of vitamin C, a big jar of, of niacinamide. But first, she says, take this PIQ test. Now I remember what the PIQ test was from the first time. So I. Yeah. You know, it wasn't the same. It didn't look the same. My answers were so. My answers are all. How do you say yes or no to this true, false, true or false? Uh, you know, you can't say that because this is all a paradox we're dealing with. So I was writing shit on the back, and I, the whole thing was covered. And it looked like a madman had done it. Yeah, but it was all true. That was didn't say that, yes or no. That was the true one. Yeah, yeah, right. And so uh, uh, and then I took the niacinamide, and about two weeks later, I was fine. But then they sent me up to a, a Reichian psychiatrist in Midtown who who gave me another PIQ test and and talked to me a while. And, ta- and, and they made me talk in the tape recorder. And then so they have th- three PIQ tests, before, during, and after, and um, uh, narrative before, during, and after, you know. Yeah. Of me, so I'm a well-studied case. I, I am the only um, legally sane person that you've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got more than the. Uh, 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 I got I got made sane. I got certified sane. Three times. Three times. Well, no, actually, only the third time. But you know. Okay, was, can we pin? Would uh, you say that this 40 days was the beginning after Labor Day, September 66, and goes into the October 8th, say, or middle of October? Or did well, I was still oh, no, I was I was still high. Um, I remember Halloween, and I remember, you know, I don't know when I came down off of it, but I uh, the forty days. So you would say the forty days uh, may have started at first of October, or I think it might have started at the, you know, yeah. Goes into uh, I always say I always celebrate my birthday as October sixth, nineteen sixty six, because we were trying to beat the date. Right. So it could have been a few days or a week before that date. That you took it. Yeah. That George White gave you that stuff. Yeah. Or well, gave it to Rod, who then right. gave it to me. Yeah. Now, yeah. two two thoughts. First of all, yeah. if they were studying you, yeah. spying on you, they see you're a friend of Rod. They knew to give it to Rod. Yeah. To get it to you. Right. And so that was what that guy warned you about. Yeah. He warned that they were going to get you, and yeah. they did. Yeah. With that stuff, right? Right. Uh-huh. And that was through Rod. They watched who your network yeah, was. Yeah, so I'm walking down the street with Rod saying, wow, this is amazing. And, I, and then all this stuff. And then when I finally brought up the question of could this have been the government dosing, you know? Yeah. Uh, he says, no, the government doesn't give any drugs, especially they wouldn't give you any good drugs <laughs> like this, you know, because he took it too. Right. But he right. said he thought it was nothing, nothing more than just acid, LSD. That he right. he must have been taking some fucking strong acid, is all I can say. But he said that to you in the first couple of hours. Yeah, 
Yeah, that it was not, it couldn't be a government drug. Or when, you know, after, shortly after I saw the guy, you right. know, walking on the street in a cashmere coat, and that happened, we got over the East Village other, you know, there was a bird, uh, like a tropical bird in the, trapped in the office. And we went, you know, he, and Rod wanted to catch it and let it loose into the park. And he said, hey, you know, we'd done the pay stops, and there was a cardboard on the, I just reached at random on the cardboard and gave it to him, and he took, a box and there was a column the bird was between the glass and a column and he put the box on one side took the cardboard and pushed it against the other side and the bird went into the box and then he closed the lid and opened the door and let the bird out you know and then we looked at the card involved and the card on one side had a, a drawing of the sun and it said life and on the other side it had skull and crossbones and it said death Huh. on the thing and so everything was that cosmic dimension you know the met right. metaphorical dimension so at some point i said man this is what you know, whatever this is man this is and you know he says oh, this is just nothing but a regular acid you know and i said no i think the government gave us something he says the government never gave you good drugs <laughs> they'll give you bad drugs <laughs> That's what he Rod. That's what Rod said. Yeah. Now that's about three hours after taking it. Oh, I don't know. I don't remember. No. But, but it I don't, I, I, no, I think it was already dawn. It was already the next day before. Right they, when you're doing the bird thing. The bird thing happened at dawn, and then the he let, day, let it yeah. uh, let it go in the dawn, and then probably the next afternoon or something like that, or maybe even the next day we had the conversation. Uh, about the uh, drugs about the, the government. Drug, yeah. But did you take it in the afternoon? No, I took it at night. Took it at night. Mm -hmm. Okay, the interesting thing is, is that if you're going through October into November, mm -hmm. that period, mm -hmm. and be interesting to get date, is on October 29th mm -hmm. that Carol and I hook up. Mm -hmm. So you were, if, if you got solved, mm -hmm. when you fixed it, if you got fixed uh, on October 28th, mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and then two weeks later, mm -hmm. then you cleared it up, and then we got together. Mm -hmm. See? Here's the timing. Um, I don't know. If I, I don't think Or I, did we get together, and I, that helped you out of it? I don't know. But, uh, you know, the walking I mean, I'm trying to match the dates. I don't... I think I... I know the exact dates. I, I want For I, me. Oh, yeah, I don't know them. I, I went into... Um, uh, I can't remember uh, Thanksgiving that year or Christmas. I'm right, so you're in that state. I try to remember, you know, Thanksgiving. I can't remember even having Thanksgiving or Christmas. Because you're in this weird state. Well, I know I gave all my money away. I left my door and my loft open all the time, you know, <laughs> and when I left. Is that, is that during the 40 days or, or after during, the 40 well, days? Well, when I call the 40 days, you know, I don't know if it was 40 days. It might have been 40 days and nights, you know. That's where that's what I came up with in the middle of the trip. My God, this is forty days, <laughs> forty days and forty nights. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. But is there we you know that um, it had something to do with October sixth. It was around there that this happened. Yeah, October sixth is the date yeah. I, I call my birthday. Right. So it could have been you know it could have been anywhere in the end of September. Right. But and it went over to October, through October. Right, because you were intending to take. Yeah, well, that's the point. You were taking this yeah. stuff before it was illegal. Yeah, so you had that was it. It, it had to do before October sixth. Right? Yeah. So that gets you into um, near the. I say that you fucking came out of it. You got cured by the niacinamide, which is mm -hmm. something that Carolyn would give to people. Niacinamide and vitamin C in combination, apparently. We had our first niacinamide mm -hmm. in '69 when Dave gave it. Oh yeah. That's why I, we our first niacinamide was Dave Worcester in mm -hmm. Seattle. Mm -hmm. So you got your niacinamide, then Carol and I hooked up. Mm -hmm. We were ready to move into the new plane of existence. Mm -hmm. Walter had been brought into harmony. Mm -hmm. He'd gone through the uh, mystical Rai experience. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know about that. Because <laughs> I don't know who Rai is. You know? I know. Well, that's yeah. part of what you're going to talk today yeah. about. Yeah. Right. That's what That's what get into the structure of hypnosis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be great. I'm going to do it. So that's a pretty good story. Yeah. It's a good good first session you had. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, that's how I remember things. I remember what I was doing. You actually remember the days, though, don't yes. you? Yes. <laughs> I can remember almost every day of my life. Uh, I, I think that's a curse. <laughs> it can be. Uh, I mean, I don't want to remember the fucking days. You know. Well, that's interesting. That's one of the... Sometimes I don't like to remember certain things, so yeah. I, I think, shit, I wish I had a, no memory. Yeah. But... um. 
I generally I don't. I have a pretty good. I have not too many bad things. So yeah, it's no, not overloaded no. with bad memories. <clears throat> no, but I just don't like the idea that we are temporal. You know, we're not. You know, we are mortal and temporal, and I don't like to remember that. Because I feel, well, but I the reason I have a good memory maybe is that I don't identify with the present. That's good. I'm yeah. not here, mm-hmm. so I can remember every. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not blocking it for mortal reasons. Yeah, most people are just trying to get present. You're, you know, yeah. you're, you're not even close. <laughs> I, I know. I know. It, 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 Dave, <laughs> Dave Worcester, one time in '77, on a, mm-hmm. in someone's house in on Venice Beach, um, we were talking, mm-hmm. and then. Uh, it was at night time on the brand, and then he said, what did you just say? Mm-hmm. And I restated exactly what I had said. Mm-hmm. And he says, very good, Bob. That means you're, you know, you're in the present. Yeah. And so I like the way he tested me on that. Yeah. And I passed the test with flying colors. Yeah. Because he was checking to see how, how much was I there with him. Mm-hmm. Now, what time did that happen? I would say about uh, midnight. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, I, I know exactly. I don't yeah. know the address. Yeah. I know I can see the veranda, and I can see him and me in the back. We were at some party, but we were outside. And when Dave and I get together, we would always be intently talking. Everybody else is partying. Dave and I are mm-hmm. probing the, the, the deep recesses of Rai. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. I was a real person. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Someone that you know, that he could interact with. Yeah. Yeah. He always he, he he'll probably say it. He says, uh, "If I want to know where I what I did, I just ask Bob. He tells yeah. me what I did and when yeah. I did it." Uh, I think it's great. He calls he refers to uh, uh, Bob and Connie. Yes, yes, yes. You know. And oh that, that, well, wait a minute. Huh? No, Bob and Connie. Yeah. They're the guys who st- the gay lovers who I want you to Google. Oh. Bob Carr, Robert Carr. It's a great Google because. Oh. A uh, uh, car tells his diary. It's a diary or something. Him, he's involved with this. The anti Krishnamurti. There is a, there is a uh, some guy who's a Manipian guru. Mm-hmm. And his name's Krishnamurti, but he's not the other Krishnamurti. Not the Krishnamurti. Yeah. Yeah. He's the anti Krishnamurti, <laughs> the Manipian. Uh-huh. And you Google him, and you'll and put Krishnamurti and Bob Carr. Okay. And uh, matter of fact, I've probably got a list. I should send it to you. Okay. And you see a diary. Bob Carr tells his diary, and in 1995, he tells when he how he hears how Connie died. Mm. Now, Bob yeah. and Connie <laughs> set set up the center of integration in the 50s. <laughs> Dave meets them, and and they're very important in his life. Bob uh-huh. and Connie. So uh-huh. I don't think uh-huh. he was referring to me. He was talking about Bob and oh, Bob was. Carr and Connie. Oh. Who, I don't know what Connie's last name was. Mm. And so in '69, I meet Bob. I don't know if we met Connie. I remember meeting Bob. And uh, they were a bit distant because they thought Dave was running a cult, and they didn't they didn't care about channeling because they yeah. were into Christian Murdy, which was you know you don't yeah. go into channeling. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but here it is. Mm-hmm. I told Dave this earlier this year. Um, it's nine. Year, it's he hasn't seen Bob. Who they ran a restaurant in San Francisco in the eighties, mm-hmm. and they had one of the first light shows in in the sixties up mm-hmm. in L A. and in Seattle and San Francisco. So they were part of the Grateful Dead world and all that. Oh. And uh, and so they knew a lot about that world, but then they went to India or something, and they're always very involved with Christian Murdy. But mm-hmm. here is Dave hasn't seen him in 20 years mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. And I went on and I found these guys, so I told Dave, hey, here's what happened to Connie, and mm-hmm. I read it to him. And he says, shit, he fucking died. I never knew that. Mm-hmm. And, and Bob's still alive because it was written like 2001. Mm-hmm. But that's who he meets with Bob, Bob and Connie. But we meet these fuckers. This is psychodrama. Mm-hmm. This is what I mean that you get involved with Dave. Mm-hmm. The effects precede the causes. Mm-hmm. Or the psychodrama. This I hear about Bob and Connie from 69 on. Because mm-hmm. it was very important, the relationship he had with them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Bob and Connie probably were fucking with Dave and whoever Dave was with, probably Vern, when they were fucking with the Dalai Lama's brother. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's always <laughs> Bob and Connie. Mm-hmm. So when when Dave heard about this Bob Dobbs stuff, yeah. it was a big laugh. I mean, Bob mm-hmm. and Connie. Here mm-hmm. I am talking about Bob and Connie, but for Dave, he acted it out in the fifties with Bob and right, Connie. Right, right. So he may be referring to us, but he might be referring to the other Bob and Connie. Well, uh, yeah, maybe. So I don't that's know. what you have to make a distinction. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't know there was another Bob and Connie. <laughs> there, there um, were the effects before I yeah, showed up. Right. Uh, I gotta. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to run. Okay, well, we had a good good run here. Yeah, I got to go to... This is great. You got this free phone. 
Yeah, well, it's three, 30 bucks a month. You know. Yeah, but you can talk for a, a thousand hours. Yeah, that's you really just good. keep talking. Yeah. But, uh, no, that's good. Yeah, i got to go down to the uh, get my Kazadex. So November 13th, 2004, your next 20 years starts by hooking up with Worcester. That's oh, yeah. symbolic. Yeah, November you 13th. You made it to the, someone you could talk to. Yeah, yeah. What is November 13th? When, uh, is it it some, doesn't have any resonance right now. It doesn't have any buddies. November birth- 11th, two days after Remembrance Day. Yeah. Remember it. Yeah, Google it. November thirteenth. See what happens. Yeah, we'll see who's who did what on this day. Yeah. Well, it is eleven. Wait a minute. It's a twenty-two. It's eleven and thirteen. Mm-hmm. One from three is two. Eleven is two. So it's a twenty-two day. Well, that's good, man. Yeah. yeah. That's, and it's two thousand four, which is eight. Mm-hmm. Or four minus two is two. Three two. So it's a lot in there. Mm, tomorrow's a twenty-three day, then, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, gonna, what is it? The fourteenth. I'm going to talk to him tomorrow. Yeah, but it's 14, which is your number. Yeah. See, that's why you didn't tape today. It's the 14th, oh. um, okay. which is uh, your birthday, May 14th. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how old, what are you? That would be, it's six months. Hmm? It's six months in your, in what year? Uh, are you 65? I'm 65 now. So Worcester was 65 in... In, um, He's eleven years older than me. So nineteen ninety three when he's telling me about Rai in the yeah. final stages. Oh, oh. So eleven years later, mm-hmm. you reach his age yeah. after he told me what I'm explaining to you yeah. back in no in ninety three. Right. On your birthday, probably on May. It was in the spring of ninety three. It was probably mm-hmm. May fourteen ninety three. He told me this. Great. About the residue of Rai, and, so and Clinton got five years. So you're a predeterminist then, huh? Yeah. Well, well, yes. We all know that. <laughs> all times have already happened. Yeah, the Evergreens yeah. lay that. Out. Yeah. It's all happening. It all happened. Yeah. And it's going to happen again. Yeah. Again and again and We're again. We're going to keep doing it again and again. Yeah. It, yeah. I guess we take different. Like I'll be Walter in the next time again, and there is and I'll no game. I'll be talking to, to Bob and, and describing. Yeah. And Bob, you will be me saying, "Well, what what time was it?" Yeah, <laughs> and there is no gain. Yeah, there is no game. It may be a gain, but it's no gain. <laughs> a game, a game, and a game, and a, a game. gain, and the game, and gain, and a game, and again. <laughs> It's all forever, eternally, again and again. But there ain't well, no oh, game. Well, that's what you got to ask Dave. What? Here's it's interesting. Someone just posted a variation of this. You ask Dave uh-huh. about how it's it's two people can get together. Mm-hmm. Uh, very rare when three people get together mm-hmm. can can kind of have something pretty good. Mm-hmm. Four people is almost impossible. Mm-hmm. But if you get four people going, that's amazing, and that's the power of three point one, or maybe it's one point three. Mm-hmm. You got to ask him about the one point three or the three point one. That that's a really interesting uh, metaphysic, mm-hmm. and uh, um, yeah, that's, that, well, that was it. The three point one. Okay. So the four people. Okay. Humans can't get four people together. Well, yeah. Shit, they can't get one person together. Right, you can't get one, mm-hmm. two attempted. They got multiple personalities just to keep them from being alone. You know. Yes. yes. <laughs> and then then you add write this one down: the hundred forty-four aspects in our brain. Oh yeah. You know the 144.